sharing with us his experience in the Wet'suwet'en Nation located in Northern Canada. It is my honor to introduce to you Hereditary Chief Was of the Cassiac House, one of three houses of the Gidmaten clan. He is a spokesperson, teacher, and spiritual advisor who stewards the land of Cassiac community. Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have had continuous authority over Wet'suwet'en territory since time immemorial, but the Canadian government gave permission to the company Coastal GasLink to build several gas pipelines on Wet'suwet'en land without consulting the Wet'suwet'en nation. Now, Wet'suwet'en land defenders are criminalized for exercising their Indigenous rights and their right to freedom of peaceful assembly upon their own land. Thank you for joining us today, Chief Wass, and for sharing with us your knowledge and experiences. Thank you for the introduction. Good day, everybody. Good evening. From uh, Cassia land, the wonders of technology. I'm way in the middle of the bush. And um, I'm glad to be with, with everybody here tonight. <clears throat> As you may have all know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Chief Was. I'm the house chief for Cassia, Grizzly House. One of the three houses, one is Anakaski, the other one is Anakaski, uh, house, a house near Flat Rock. And then uh, the other one is, uh, and that's led by Medik. Medik is um, the house chief. The other one, the other house is Kastewe, Kayahwanits, that's um, the village in the middle. So there's three houses in Gidimdan clan. And uh, as you all know too, that um, some 15 years ago, the pipeline started to erupt. People started to talk about pipelines, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And we were on the wayside watching. And um, at that time I wasn't, I wasn't Chief Was yet. I was still being groomed. Um, however, in 2019 is when I started, uh, when I got the name Was, and then I became the house chief for the Grizzly House. Before that, uh, late Jeff Brown was in the front lines uh, for us, Kadam Dan's. He, he was the house chief for... Uh, uh, Anakaski. He was integral in bringing people out here where we're at right now. He was integral in getting directions, giving directions to uh, Slato, uh, Marley Wickham, Jen Wickham, and all the other supporters that came to, to help us out. Because at that time, uh, the uh, Pipeline was already in the making. And what had happened was they knew that we were um, not for pipelines. We, we said in one of our feasts, no pipelines through our territory due to the environmental impacts that it'll have. So they circumvented the, um, the, the they, they made up their own process and they circumvented us the hereditary chiefs and the house chiefs by signing documents, consensual documents, so to speak, with ban, elected ban councillors. And uh, when they did that, they, that was their green light to go ahead with the pipeline. And um, However, we said no at one of the feasts. We had, we said no pipelines through the territory, and that was initiated way back when when um, Enbridge first started to. Uh, they they wanted a pipeline going through its own territory, and and that's that sparked the uh, concerns about ter pipelines going through our territory. And since then. Uh, we had supporters, we had people uh, give us information regarding uh, pipelines that were proposed by industry and, and the government of BC. 
and um, we got a hold of the information. We got a hold of the time frames, and and so so as as time progressed, coming to 2000. Uh, 17, 18, that's when they started to come around, started talking about the pipelines, making deals with uh, band councillors, the elected band councillors, who are controlled by the federal government anyways. So, and then came the, uh, um, the project of, of clearing the right of way and then came the um, uh, soldiers coming in. But we 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 started to realize that they were going to do they were going to do it anyways. And like I said uh, in my opening, because uh, this. this Anagaski, the house chief at that time was Lake Jeff Brown. And he was integral in being out here. Uh, he was uh, looking after all of the territories. And and he came out to uh, what we call the Camp 44, the Morris FSR 44. And they determined that um, what they could do was was since they were not listened to, since they were not uh, being listened to by the governments and industry, uh, so they decided to establish a roadblock, and that roadblock came up in uh, 2019, and then at that time in March, that's when I became WAS House Chief WAS. And I came out here and I seen what was uh, going on. And uh, they filled me in on the reasons why the the, the uh, pipe, the roadblock was there. And predominantly the, mo the main reason was uh, we said no. The house chief said no about uh, five years prior, well, sorry, three years prior. Uh, the house chiefs, all of the house chiefs said no to the to any pipelines going through territory, the Wet'suwet'en territory. That's why the roadblock came up, and then that was in support of the decision of the hereditary chiefs. Supporters came from uh, all over, and uh, the uh, lead person for our area here, the Cassia land, was Slato, Molly Wickham. When I became WAS, uh, she immediately filled me in on what was going on, the logistics behind the camp, the roadblock, and uh, and the uh, anticipation of what was going to happen next. And sure enough, uh, here, they, here they come, all the armed policemen, the military style uh, policemen came in with dogs uh, and then they literally outnumbered uh, the supporters they, they bulldozed uh, right through the through the blockade and they literally manhandled everyone including women reporters uh, they, they handcuffed everybody and cleared the way of, of that area. The, the place where we have a camp right now, they totally bulldozed and, and destroyed everything that was constructed then. And um, so, so that was it. They thought uh, they thought they, uh, they got um, they got rid of us, but uh, but we came back. Uh, we we set up another roadblock uh, right around the uh, 27 kilometers, 39 kilometers, and again here at 44. Um, I, I gotta I gotta step back a little bit and 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 
and let you know why the 44 was was set up. Um, our friends up at Tunisutan, they're around 63. Uh, they have a, um, a healing camp up the road uh, with Frida Houston, Brenda Michelle, and all the all the other supporters were up there. And then they heard of this pipeline coming through, so they made um, made it known that they were gonna they were, they were gonna they were not gonna allow that pipeline to go through. And and they seek. They seek um, help from the other houses. Uh, lo and behold, Cassia was just down the road. Lo and behold, uh, the, the the road that's going to go through to get the pipes through uh, is right on Cassia land, and that ended up right at the bridge where 44 is right now. So... Um, that's how that's how things started. Was was um, uh, Honesuta and the the healing camp. They they wanted assistance, and then so we set up the camp here at forty four to slow down the industry, to slow down the pipeline, the project itself, so that Honesuta can start bracing themselves on on what they're gonna do to stop people come come from coming in. So all of this was happening uh, uh, 2019, then 2020 came around. Uh, a lot of um, uh, on the land engagements were happening. Uh, the chiefs got together, they did an eviction letter to Coastal Gas Link. They did a man camp up the road. Uh, Frida Houston delivered that, that letter uh, advising that all of the people had to vacate the premises because we were going to lock down the road again. We gave them eight hours, and that's when uh, the police um, and all of them started to get ready as well. So things were heating up, and... Um, after that, uh, all of a sudden, the, the, whoever was at the camp started to leave right in the middle of the night because they knew that we were going to block the road again. Uh, one or one of two reasons why we we're going to block the road again. One, uh, the main reason was the chief's letter of uh, big, um, uh, evicting CGL off our territory. So they delivered the letter then. And the other one was um, CGL was uh, uh, the the right of way was was going to go right under Wichinqua, right under the river, so the pipeline was going to go under the river. Slero came to me and said uh, they're going to go right under the river, and and we need to do something. We can't allow that to happen. So. I went on a line with um, the other chiefs. I said, "Look, they they're gonna under, go under the river. We're gonna we're gonna stop them." So after I, I told the chiefs, uh, I instructed Slato set up a camp down at uh, Coyote Camp. We call it, and that's just right at where the uh, uh, the pad is where they're gonna start drilling the drill pad. They call it. And then that was in in 2020. A new year came along. The, uh, nothing happened. People were in the camps. Sato was at Coyote Camp. My daughter was at Coyote Camp. And people were at 44. We set up uh, another roadblock at 39. And with all that, <clears throat> started to brew up. We started seeing helicopters start to roam around. We started to see the uh, buildup of police, the police force, military style, all of the, um, uh, like there was a force of uh, approximately 75 to 100 people that, that started to come around. 
and then they were all there with these bulletproof uh, uh, vehicles going up the road, snipers, dogs. Um, they all came in uh, all at once, and they started removing people. People went to jail. And and all of this just occurred within that same year. And then um, one year went by after that, you know, the pandemic hit. Things were really slowing down, but the pipeline was, uh, while, the, while the pandemic uh, was was in full swing, the people still came up here and, and they were still working. They were still uh, like more than 30 people at the time in their vans or, or in their buses and they were going up to the site. They were still doing the work while the pandemic was going on. So we knew it was kind of like a scare tactic, but we still, we still maintained our, our spots here. We're, we're still here. And um, some year and a half later, after the pandemic, Molly got a, a, a note from their attorney general saying that they're going to be charging her. Another supporter is going to be charged. Uh, two, one from Kixan and one from uh, uh, Kanawagi, I believe. So these are the three people that are still on trial right now. Um, they're going to be sentenced uh, sometime next week. We're, we're not sure what, what the judge is going to say about that. Um, and, and then uh, we did a uh, uh, counter suit against the RCMP. Uh, that's still ongoing as well. So there's still a lot of legal battles that are happening right now. But amidst all of that, uh, we were looking at um, Honesutan, what they were doing up there. They had trap sites, they had young people trapping up there, learning. And this project totally destroyed all the trap sites, totally destroyed all the traps, pulled those right over it. And that's that's their right to, to do what they what we've done what we've been doing since time immemorial we were here a lot a long time obviously we didn't have any steel traps but we had we had our own ways of trapping and then and, and providing fur fur bearing animals the furs from the fur bearing animals to, to make our clothes etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, my point is is that they just literally did not care about our rights, of the, our traditional activity that is happening out here. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have, saw, have seen Yenta, that uh, documentary. Uh, there is a portion there that shows um, that where the trap sites have been destroyed. So... All of this is, is still going on. The, the RCMP literally did not care about our safety uh, nor the safety of the supporters. Uh, there was two elders that were involved. They didn't care about them. They manhandled them. They manhandled my, my daughter who was pregnant at the time and uh, literally pointing guns at them when when they were just all unarmed, and and it's just, it's all scare tactics. I know that, but but pointing firearms at them uh, was was one of the the scariest thing that I ever saw. Uh, my daughter being up there, Slato being up there, all the women being up there uh, with all these rifles pointing at them. It's it, it's real. It it, it happened. Um, right now, like I said, they're gonna wait till probably next week or within a two week time frame is when the judge is gonna hand down the sentencing.
that's that's basically what's happening here. Uh, Ona Sutan, I believe they're um, they're carrying on with their traditional teachings up there. Uh, they're they're rebuilding. We've rebuilt. I'm, I'm uh, right now. I'm uh, leading in uh, rebuilding the trap lines, building cabins on the trap lines, and we're doing it. Uh, where our ancestors used to do it all the time. There, there's traditional sites out there. We're revitalizing all of that, and uh, now we're hearing the BC government has um, has has listened to uh, some of the concerns that the conservatives have. Uh, they're wanting to to get us off the land again. And I'm not sure for what reason. And um, there's more pipelines that have been that have been uh, uh, planned in our area again. So we're bracing for that. We don't want to. We 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 we've learned from our our experience with what has happened with the supporters and and so forth. Now that doesn't mean we're going to be. We, we're going to go full out in arms or, or whatever. We're just our our main goal is is awareness. Our main goal is to have people made aware that our water, our environment is is really in jeopardy, and that is it's. If these other pipelines come through, um, you know the. It's, it's going to be a lot more damaged than most people think because after this pipeline that went through, all of a sudden they're they're saying that these uh, compressor stations are starting to be constructed. And when we reviewed the compressor stations and what they do and how loud they are, it's a, it's a comparison to a uh, 747 jet engine. That's going to be going twenty four seven, and that's how loud it's going to be. So there's one about fifty kilometers. Well, not even that much. It's about twenty kilometers away from us here. So we're be, we're going to be able to hear it from here, and and that that part there we we it caught us off guard. We didn't know that compressor stations were going to be a part of the pipeline. We thought it was just going to be a straight pipeline. But, uh, and, and um, so, so we got a, uh, Molly and, and, and her uh, other supporters, uh, those that are helping her are finding ways on how to, um, how to help us to, to mitigate that compressor station with the noise and what it needs to be fed, what you know, what what's in what's in store for us with all that noise that's going to be happening. So that's that's where we're at right now. That's that's what we're facing. Um, in the meantime, my my Zen out here is is I got about six young men. And women, they're they're involved, following me uh, just about every day, checking the traps, getting the traps done, building the cabin, and uh, just carrying on with our our what we do, our traditional activities, and and that's where we're at. I I. I know I was going all over the place with this pipeline thing. It's it just it's just, it's really uh, traumatizing for most of us. Uh, we 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 want to talk about it in detail, but but um, as there are some scary parts there that we we some some of us we don't want to go there. It's um, I, I mean, I thought the good old Western days were over, but people are still carrying guns and they're still pointing it at pointing it at people. So 
it's, it's still real. It still happens. I would say that's, I think my 20 minutes is up, isn't it? Yes, but I, I certainly don't want to cut you off. We're all very grateful to be hearing your story and your experiences. And uh, we're all looking forward to figuring out how we can move forward in solidarity with you to help you on this journey that you and your nation are dealing with right now. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Was. Um, I guess I guess I'll ask one question if that's okay. Um, yep. What uh, What do you feel um, you and everyone on the ground dealing with this with you would want us to be doing to continue to show our support for you? Is there any next steps you would suggest? I think uh, I think some of your folks do visit us up here, and they see that we're 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 um, <clears throat> we're continuing with our traditional activities out here on the land, and um, I think our fight right now is with the BC government, uh, Canada. We haven't even you know, like like the only time Canada came around was. Um, when we shut down Canada and, and all of a sudden they sent these uh, pencil necks uh, to us saying that um, we want to sign an MOU with you. And um, that's the last time we saw them. And, and that's, that, that tells it all. Anyways, what, what we're seeing right now uh, with the BC government is that they would want some some uh, push, uh, like what they did to us long time ago, uh, getting us back onto the reserve, uh, limiting us on our hunting and our traditional ways out here. I I think um, that's where we can have international support of sort. And letting people know that uh, these are our basic uh, rights as as humans. We still exist out here. We still depend on the fish. We still depend on our water. Uh, we still depend on our wildlife out here. We we're, we're still here. And and I think that awareness, uh, not only for Wet'suwet'en, but but for all of the indigenous groups throughout BC and Canada, I think we're going to be feeling the same thing. We're going to be, we're going to be, uh, because what had happened was with, with all of the international pressures, with all of the international attention that, that we, we, that we had with this pipeline conflict, I think that's the main thrust of, of why uh, people are now visualizing, oh, yeah, okay, the indigenous people really do own this land. And and then on the other side of the uh, uh, that perspective, our people, uh, mostly at, in the industry and government levels, they don't believe that. They just, they just want us on the reserve. They just want us to stay there and not progress at all. So that's still happening. It's, it's still, um, I, I think that kind of awareness, uh, because it's it's more deeper than, than right now, it's more deeper than pipeline issues. It's, it's more like uh, basic human rights. We exist out here. And um, so, I hope that answers your question. That's that's pretty well the area that I think uh, once we start people um, having that awareness and and that that this is, for example, I'm sitting on my my land here. Uh, I'm not on a reserve, and and I have a peace hall next to my little cabin, and also I I built my own trap line. 
and I have another cabin nine kilometers away because this this trap line is long. I need to rest somewhere, so I built another cabin on the nine kilometers away, right in the bush, in the middle of nowhere. And um, and what I'm finding is like there's going to be some some pushback from the local governments. They want those trees. They want those minerals. You want uh, those pipelines that keep coming through. Uh, these <clears throat> the trap lines that I'm doing are right in the way of these pipelines, the proposed pipeline. So it's not by accident. It's just the way it is. It's, we, we always have this trap line. So, and, and my, I guess my point is, is that we exist. We will still continue to exist. We're not, we're not on the reserve anymore. Some of us, some of us are out here living on the land, and uh, but there's a few of us out here. Most most of the people are still on the reservation. So, I I believe that more awareness, international awareness, the UN uh, pressure. Uh, would would definitely help, and and again, um, who knows what's going to be happening with uh, Trudeau and all of them? Uh, because now that Trump is out down there, uh, wanting the uh, Keystone to, to to go ahead, that's what we heard. We're ready for him too, so we don't mind. Thank you again so much, Chief Wasnikwich.